in Jesus' mighty name. And everyone said, amen. Well, we are starting a brand new series this morning called No God. Not N-O, God. <laughs> it's K-N-O-W, God. Everybody say, No God. I want to know God. How many of you want to know God? See, that's, that's one of the greatest, I'm, I'm telling you, to me, that's like one of the greatest aims and goals of my life is I just want to know God better. But see, the wonderful thing is this, that do you know that God wants you to know him more than you even want to know him? I'll say that again. God wants you to know him even more than you want to know him. He actually desires to be known and found by you. That's God's desire. You know, my, my wife and I celebrated 17 years of marriage yesterday. Come on, baby. <clears throat> 17 years. And, uh, and you know, I, I was reminiscing a little bit on my, my wife and I's journey, some of our journey, because we had some interesting situations. Because we, we actually had a, a relation, we, were, we had a long distance relationship for two and a half years. We, we were together three and a half years before we got married, and two and a half of those years were long distance. Either I was in college, and she was on Maui, or I was on Maui, and she was in college, and we were back and forth, and it was, it was craziness. And in those, in those moments of relationship, there are all these apprehensions. And it was quite interesting because as wonderful as she not just was, but is, as wonderful as she is, there were apprehensions in my life, not necessarily because of her, but because of issues I had to deal with. And it caused friction and hindrances in our relationship. And until those issues, that's the reason why we dated for three and a half years is because I had issues. Now, look, let me tell you something. The Holy Spirit actually spoke to her that I was her husband. And secondly, she fine. She's so fine. She blow my mind. Anybody know what I'm talking about? <laughs> so the issue, the issue wasn't her. You need to hear this. The issue wasn't her. The issue was me. I had some, thanks, babe. She was like, it was you. <laughs> and it spit at a son too. Anyways, oh, we had issues in that relationship because of me. And you know what I realized as I was kind of reminiscing on some of those, that relationship and some of the things we went through is God is amazing in every single way. And as we evaluate and we, we, we try to comprehend and understand our relationship with God, truth be told, the issue, There we go. The issue's not with him. The issue's with us. And I say that because as we, as we read this passage, Jesus made a way. See, if God desires to be in relationship even more than we desire to be in relationship with him, we see by the action of God that he did everything necessary to remove the barrier that hindered us. I want you to imagine just for a moment that on this side is God and he desires relationship with us and on this side is you. That's right, you and me. This us right here. Between God and us is this barrier. For right now, just imagine it's a barrier. It's invisible right now. I'm going to walk through it a lot. So if you're not careful, if you don't use your imagination, you're going to have some problems with that. So just imagine a barrier right here. And what happens is this, the Bible says, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. What does it reveal to us? That even while you were lost in your sin, you had issues, you were far from God, God had it in his heart to pursue you. See, if we're going to know what it is to know God, we have to understand his nature and his character. And the nature and the character of God is defined by one word. He's a pursuer. I'll say that again, God pursued you. I think some of you need to get happy because even when you were far off, when you were lost, when you were lost, you were so, you were over here picking your nose, minding your own business, looking at other things, completely and totally unaware, even when you were in the midst of being completely unaware. God was on this side, watch this. 
God was on this side making a way to remove the barrier. <laughs> See, you didn't have power to remove the barrier. The barrier is too big, too heavy for you. As a matter of fact, you were so lost, we, I, so lost in my sin that I didn't even realize that there was a barrier between me and God because all I could see was me. I was in my own world. And this is what's amazing, that even when I was lost as I could possibly be, completely unaware, God right here was making a way. He was doing everything he could to remove this barrier so that I could experience a relationship with him. See, if we're going to understand what it is to know God, we have to know, number one, God pursues you. He's a pursuer. He is crazy, passionate, in pursuit for you. He's just like, you know, can I just tell you something? Some of us have this, this wrong mindset. We actually, we actually think that when we wake up in the morning, we have to do all these spiritual exercises to get God's attention. You know what I mean? Like if we do a hundred prayer jumping jacks and, and we, we say Hail Mary enough in the morning that God will show up. I got news for you. He's already there. Why? Because he's in a constant state of pursuit. He's always pursuing. So when you wake up in the morning, guess what? God's already been pursuing you. He's already there pursuing you. He's desiring you. He's longing for you. And so really, you don't have to do lot, a lot to connect with him. All you got to do is wake up and be like, hello. I become aware. See, it's about your awareness. God is omnipresent. He's everywhere. The only thing the only thing that creates a barrier between us and the reality of him and connecting with him in our life is whether we're aware or not. It's your awareness. Are you aware of his presence? When you wake up in the morning, do you go, man, there's a God pursuing me today. I'm going to pursue him back. Come on, somebody. He's a God of pursuit. But this is the second thing I love. Bible says that God demonstrated his love for us in this, that while we were sinners, Christ died for us. This is what's incredible. Not only as we understand the nature of God, is God a pursuer. Now this is to know him, right? Is God a pursuer. But he also reveals himself. This is incredible. He held nothing back from you. I want you to think about this, because now watch this, watch this, watch this. God, through Jesus, for God so loved the world that he sent his one and only son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life, right? While we were yet sinners, Christ demonstrated love for us that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So we see now this pursuit that God does through Jesus, God deals with everything that separates. So I want you to imagine this veil now, watch this. This veil through Jesus Christ, becoming the lamb that was slain, paying the price. The Bible says becoming the propitiation for you. What does that mean? That he actually took your place on that cross. All right? He carried the weight and the burden of sin upon himself. So what he did is by his actions of going to the cross, he removed the veil. So now, now watch this, watch this, watch this. Because of his pursuit, he moves the veil. He does it all. You didn't do a thing. He removed it. Now we're over here, and he's over there, and he's like, I came into your world. You couldn't come into my world. So because we couldn't enter into his world, meaning we couldn't deal with the veil, the Bible says that he took on robes of flesh. Now watch this. And crossed over and dwelt among us. He moved into a realm. He brought heaven into the realm that was so disconnected. Can I tell you something? God is an expert of bringing heaven into your world. So he crosses over. He removes the veil. But this is what's awesome. He, he crosses over, and he doesn't hide behind the veil anymore. He's no longer hidden. He reveals himself to us. He completely and totally reveals himself to us. Now, one, listen to this. One, 
He did it by his nature. What do you mean? In the Old Testament, a lot of people believe that God was hidden. But yet, God was revealing himself and his attributes all the time. Jehovah Jireh, my provider. Are, are you with me? See, Israel would hold up banners that would declare the name of God, listen, by his attributes. He made himself known. He didn't hide himself. He made himself known as deliverer, as provider, as guide, as healer, as strength. Come on, somebody. In the New Testament now, he takes on robes of flesh and he does what? He reveals himself. God in the flesh, Jesus pursued you. He took on robes of flesh. He felt what you felt. He went through what you went through and yet he remained sinless. <laughs> but then, but then, Jesus says, I must go so that the Holy Spirit can come. So he leaves us, not lonely. He leaves us with a guide and a counselor. He says, I'll never leave you, nor forsake you. See, he revealed himself in every step all the way from the Garden of Eden to even now, today, through the person of the Holy Spirit and the revelation of Jesus Christ, the reality of Jesus Christ. He is constantly revealing himself. He is not a hide-and-seek God. He is not hiding himself away from you to say, oh, well, you got to come and get some. He says, as a matter of fact, you are so unaware, I'm going to come and get you. So that's why, that's why I love, uh, this is what I love about the Holy Spirit. He'll come and invade your space even when you're unaware. See, we think that the Holy Spirit shows up only when we get desperate. That's a part of it. Because it says he's a rewarder of those who earnestly seek him. And when we see what he rewards with, he rewards with his presence. That's the greatest reward, by the way. More costly than gold or silver. Are you guys with me this morning? Look, I, I've, been, I've been hanging out for 15 days. I need to get some preach off me. So just bear with me for a moment. Hey, can I just tell you, do you want to hear the greatest testimony? I still fit my jeans. That's all I, that's all I got to say, man. You go on a Disney cruise and try and fit your jeans after that. The first time I went on the Disney cruise, I had a whole... I had a whole case full of clothes, luggage full of clothes, and I could only fit one pair of clothing. And it was, thank God I brought, I was wise enough to bring stretchy pants. <laughs> you laugh. <laughs> I just thank God I'm still wearing my same pair of jeans. Thank you, Jesus. Everybody say, he reveals himself. He pursues, he reveals himself. But this is what I love. When we understand his nature and who God is, he removes the barrier. Now, think about this for a second. He pursued us because that's his nature. He desires you. He longs for you. The Bible says he's actually jealous after you. He wants your attention. He wants your heart. He revealed himself to us, but he completely removed the barrier. And he says, all the rituals, all the protocol, all these things, the law, the commands, those aren't what lead you to me anymore. It's faith. He removes the barrier to say now there's nothing. There's nothing between us. There's nothing hindering you anymore. A lot of us, I mean, you guys remember Tim, the two-man tailor? <laughs> and his neighbor, right? I don't even remember his neighbor's name, Al, so whatever it was. But he'd talk, he'd talk to the guy through the fence like this. And this is kind of how we've seen God. We've got this whole barrier. And God says, no, this is not how I want to interact with you. I want to remove all these things. So you know what he does? This is what he does by removing the barriers. Can I come down here? Can we shine some lights down here? I want to come. I want to get closer. Get closer. <laughs> he says, I'm going to do everything I need to do the conflict and the issues that are in your heart. I'm going to confront them. See, this is the hard part about having a God that desires relationship even more than we do, is that he'll confront the areas of our life 
by his spirit and by his word. He'll confront those areas to deal with them. Not because he's angry at you, but because he's crazy in love with you. And he doesn't want anything hindering relationship. So he removes those things. And this is what's awesome. He doesn't just point them out. Can I just say that? You know, you know those guys that like, they're always quick to tell you you got a boogie in your nose or they got, they're quick to tell you something's wrong with you. That's not how God works. He wants to confront those things so that he can, because as a God that removes barriers, not only does he point them out, but he heals them. He removes them out of our life. He has the power to remove pain and hurt and offense and lust and sin and brokenness out of our life so that we can interact with him. He removes barriers. But this is the problem that I face. Maybe some of you are like me. Here's God. He's done everything right? He pursued me. He revealed himself to me. He's removed all the barriers. But I'm over here going, okay, God, I want to spend time with you, but I'm like that elephant. Well, you know the elephant? Everybody know what I'm talking about? The elephant? That as a little baby elephant, they tied a rope around its leg, and that baby elephant would just kind of move, and then as a rope would start giving it tension, it would stop, and it would stay there. And then it would move over here and stop and stay there and, and come over here and stop and stay. And then that elephant, as it grew, as it grew, they would remove the rope. And the elephant, even though it was large and strong and had the freedom to go anywhere it wanted to, it stayed within the confines of now that imaginary rope because they removed it a long time ago. But because it was preconditioned, to live because it was preconditioned to live and to think a certain way it remained hindered I'm so like that elephant God's like come on man come on let's go I've done everything come on and I'm like okay God And he's like, I've removed all the barriers. I'm coming. Because the issue is not what God has not done. The issue is not what God has not done. The issue is what I believed he's done. You hear what I just said? The issue is not what he has not done. The issue is what I believe he has or has not done. See, what we understand is this, is that there are things in our lives that continue to hinder us, that continue to hold us back from truly receiving and walking in the fullness of that relationship with God. But if we're not careful, we can see that guilty conscience that, that is referred to there in Scripture. We become incapable of confronting ourselves, confronting those barriers and dealing with those barriers. What keeps you at a distance Many of us never get to experience the fullness of relationship with God because we're unwilling to confront those issues and deal with them. The issues God's already dealt with by his power and his strength continue to taunt us and restrict us. So then how in Hebrews chapter 4, Hebrews 4.16, as I repeat this scripture again, let us then approach. What is approach? Approach means there's an effort on our part. He's already pursued. Now we approach. He's already done the work. Now you approach. See, there's, there's a responsibility on your behalf to approach God. There's a responsibility on your behalf tomorrow morning when you wake up to approach God. When all hell breaks loose in your life, not to run from God, but to what? Approach God. We get to boldly approach him. Why? Because of his grace. Did you hear what I just said? Because of the grace of God. And it says this, we get to approach him with confidence because of his grace so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us 
in our time of need. Are there areas of unbelief? Are there areas of offense and bitterness? Areas of fear, shame? How about this one? The Bible paints an interesting picture. As it talks about the children of Israel being in the wilderness and how it's said that they hardened their heart toward God. And so in the New Testament, we get this, this challenge saying, do not harden your hearts as the children of Israel did. And I realized something. There are moments in my life that my greatest hindrance is it maybe because of sin or because of issues, even offense towards God, because God didn't move the way I wanted him to move. He didn't do what I thought that he was supposed to do. And so in my mind now, there's this hardening. There's this hardening because of an offense or disappointment. And I allow that hardening, just like the children of Israel did, to affect relationship. For all you married couples, you ever had a situation where your spouse straight up called you on the carpet? Right? And the last thing you want to do is to talk to your spouse. So you just took a walk. Where are you going? I'm going for a walk. I'll be back. And she wants to work it out. She wants to work it out. Like, I don't want to work it out right now. I'm going to walk. I got to think it through. I got to process it. Anybody with me? You ever seen, you ever been through that situation? For some of us, we get stuck in this. God is like, let's work it out. And we're like, no, I want to be angry right now. Because we're justified in our anger. Because God didn't show up and show off the way we wanted him to. Because it didn't happen the way we thought it was going to happen. And all these issues and conflicts that we live with now begins to harden our heart. And if we don't confront these things and deal with these things, here's God that did everything necessary to bring him, to bring you to himself. And we remain in isolation because we continue to put up a barrier. Pastor, how do I do this? How do, I, how do I walk in freedom? How many of you want to remove the barrier? Come on. Can I just give this to you? First John chapter 1, verse 9. First John chapter 1, verse 9 says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Friends, let us never, ever, ever, ever demean the power of repentance. Because as you're on this side, see, he's done everything. The issue's not him, the issue's here. See, when I choose to repent, what I do is I acknowledge my need for him. When I repent, I'm actually acknowledging who he is. Case in point, the prodigal son, he says, I acknowledge the mess that I'm in. Watch this, watch this. I acknowledge first thing the prodigal son did is he looked around the pig pen and said, I'm in a pig pen. He acknowledged the mess. But then he said, I have a father. And he said, I can leave this place that I'm in and I can run to my father and my father will accept me and receive me. So what did he do? The Bible says he came to his senses and he left the pig pen and went to his father. You see, repentance, best thing, I'm telling you the best picture I can see of repentance is acknowledging that I'm far from God, that this mess that I'm in is hindering me, is restricting me, and I'm going to run to God. There's no repentance until you can get a revelation of God. And we repent, and this is what's amazing. The Bible says he won't condemn you, he won't reject you, he won't resist you. He says he is faithful and just and will forgive you your sins and cleanse you of all unrighteousness. This is what it is to know God. If you want to know God, you have to live a life of repentance. But the second thing is we have to have a life of faith. You've got to believe. Come on, your belief system will either free you or restrict you. 
I'll say that again. Your belief system, what you choose to believe, will either free you or restrict you. That's why one of the conditions of grace, one of the conditions of grace is faith. How do you receive grace? Faith. We understand that one of the conditions of grace is repentance. God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. When you begin to study that, you begin to understand what God is talking about. It's about a, a position of repentance, a heart of repentance. But secondly, it's faith. You've got to change your perspective. You have to change your belief system. It is your belief system on who you are and who God is that are, that's keeping you restricted. And until you can get a different thinking... And so you can get a different process of who you believe you are and who you believe God is. You will remain restricted and hindered. Your belief, your faith will either produce restriction or what? Freedom in your life. Well, the, the third thing we see as I close, Pastor Demetri, if you could come. The third thing we see is the Holy Spirit. See, the Bible actually calls him the Spirit of Grace. Capital S, Spirit of Grace. Did you know the Holy Spirit actually releases? He's a carrier of grace. So that where his freedom, that's why the Bible says where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's what? Freedom, because his presence actually carries grace. Everywhere he goes, he's like a carrier of grace. And so when you get into his presence, guess what's in his presence? Grace, mercy, peace, joy. So this is the problem. You can either stay where you're at or you can run to his presence and experience freedom. Because I'm telling you, once you get into his presence, oh, somebody, oh, somebody, once you get into his presence, things just begin to ah, fall off. Sorry, I was on a Disney cruise. <laughs> to get into his presence don't run from his presence he he removes the barrier not for you to run from him but to run to him pastor i'm messing up don't run from him run to him why his grace is sufficient come on i i minister tony i need your help everybody say faith repentance the Holy Spirit. But I want to give you, will you stand up here for me? I want to just give you one more. In the beginning of this sermon, I, I started off talking about my relationship with my wife. And uh, as beautiful as she is and it's wonderful and amazing. And even, even when she, she got a prophetic word that I was her husband and, and she held on to that. So she had the revelation already and I was, I was lost in my idiocracy. Anyways, I was lost over here, clueless. But I had some friends. I had some, some people that cared about my destiny. They were on my side. The book of James chapter 5 says this. Now this is interesting. Listen to this difference. First John says what? Confess your sins to God. And he's faithful and just. James chapter 5 says this, confess your sins one to another and pray for one another that you may be healed. <laughs> what does that tell us? That in our interaction with God to know God, we actually need some people in our life to encourage us. Now listen to this, going back to the children of Israel that hardened their heart in the desert. Hebrews chapter 3.13 says this, encourage one another daily while it's called today so that your hearts are not hardened by sin's deceitfulness. What does that mean? That means that I need faith. That means that I need to function in repentance. That means I need the Holy Spirit. But it also means that I need somebody behind me every day of my life pushing me. And there's times where I'm going to resist because I'm a jerk. Just say, okay, dude, relax, relax, relax. <laughs> it's pretty strong for a, a little guy. 
and I might resist, but guess what? I constantly have someone provoking me and encouraging me and pushing me. And I'm going to push against it because I'm like, no, I don't want to. I want to stay in my issues. No, you need to go. Come on. God loves you. No. And it's funny how much we fight over here. Even though God is saying, I've removed the barrier. Come on, come to me, all who are burdened and heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. And we fight against it. But we need some people in our life that are going to encourage us and they're going to. I had some people that looked at me and said, Are you stupid? Look at her. She's beautiful. I know. Look at her. She likes you, which is a huge miracle all in itself. And I'm like, I know, but for some reason, my issues and my apprehension kept me. But if it wasn't for people encouraging me, you got to push me, bro, and pushing me to the other side. Someone say, encourage somebody. Can I tell you why? Can I tell you why every person in this church needs to be in a life group? Because you need to be encouraged. So we have this misconception. If I just attend church, the church is now obligated to care for me and help me. I just, I have, a, I have a perfect church attendance, pastor, so that means you have, to, you have to meet every one of my needs. But the problem is what they don't realize is that's not how proper church happens. The Bible says that the early church met in the synagogues, but they also met house to house. That means that you know every person in the early church was in a life group. They were in a small group. That's where care happened. You getting cared for in this church isn't going to happen just because you have a perfect church attendance. It's going to happen because you're in a life group and you're in a ministry. You got to get in a life group. Every single one of you should be like, man, I got to get in a life group. Why? I need to be encouraged to go over the barrier and I want to interact. I want to know God. There are people in this church that are designed, their whole world is to help you know God. To help you remove the masks. Oh, snap. To help you see healing come. Just like James 5 said, what? To pray for you and lay hands on you so you can be healed.